Welcome everybody, you're watching Mr. Fugu Data Science. We're implementing lasso and ridge regression as well as elastic net using R Studio today. Check out my previous video where we went over the explanation of lasso and ridge, how they work, and relating it to linear regression. As always, thank you to the recent viewers and subscribers. I greatly appreciate it. If you could help support this channel, that would be great. Here's the handle for me at Buy Me a Coffee. You could also hit me up on Twitter and then Instagram. We have a lot of imports today, so if you want to follow along, I suggest that you pause the video and take these right now. So we're going to do a train test split real quick on the Ames, Iowa housing data. We have 2930 home properties with 82 features, which are our columns. There's a few columns that I decided to take out. These are three of them. I have a few additional ones here that I decided to take out, which are useless. I'll show real quick in a table so you can get an idea. We're doing a 70-30 train test split today. If you want to see what these data look like, you can get a glimpse right here. It's quite long, so that's why I commented this out. If you call in the library for this data set after you install it, you can call in the data like this. When you read the documentation, you're going to notice something that says make aims, and it'll tell you that it's restricting or simplifying some of the data. I'm not sure when this was last updated because these data were originally captured in 2011. But from what I've been reading, there's people who are doing new additions to this. I'm not sure if they're just cleaning it up or what's going on. If you go to Kaggle, you may have the raw data set that you have to do extensive cleaning, which could be good practice, but very time consuming for you. Here's the columns that I'm taking out. This is what it looks like. We could keep scrolling over. We have categorical data. We need to essentially turn this into dummy variables. Here's a table for the pools, miscellaneous values, and features where I decided, well, if we have a bunch of nuns and people with no pools, there's no sense of me keeping that in the data set since it's so few people who have an actual pool. I have no idea what this miscellaneous value was. Decided to throw that out as well. Here's the portion where I do the actual train test split right here. With one of the packages I imported, we could do this where we're setting up. Let me see if I could zoom in just a little bit for you. We have this initial split. I throw in my data frame, what percentage I want to split on, and then we're working here with the sales prices, set up my train and my test. I created a random seed in order to replicate my data. We create our dummy variable that I was talking about in order for us to convert the categorical into numeric so we could do some processing understand this right here in bold face always think about stabilizing your variables with standardization and centering by default you have this ability when we start messing around with the regression models but this is something you should take into account for the dummy variables we're using this model dot matrix I'm taking the sales price and I'm calling everything else in from the train doing the same thing from the test data okay I'm doing a log transform for the sales prices because we need to basically scale the, the numbers so they're the same type of magnitudes because you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of dollars instead of real small digits. After we take that, we notice that here's our dimensions that we're going to work with, okay? We need to do a quick recap of what happened from the last video. If you download the code, I attached a link for both the code and the video. But basically what we're trying to do is minimize the error. error. But unlike linear regression, we're not trying to get the best fit line that works with our training data because we have to take into account that we're trying to avoid overfitting. And the fact that we have so many variables, so many columns for our features, this creates issues with correlation. As you increase the amount of variables, you start having more issues with variables correlating with each other. In the real world, this is going to happen quite often and you're going to break your assumptions for linear regression. These features are supposed to give us information that's meaningful and aids in our interpretation, but we want to minimize the amount of noise in a relevant features when possible. Because of this high dimensional data, this is going to cause issues with interpretation as well as violating those assumptions of linear regression. That's why lasso and ridge come into play because we're adding a penalty term that will help us with our matrix operations and avoid invertibility problems with singular matrices. Now, let's look at a heat map real quick. To, let's look at a heat map real quick. Feel free to pause the video. We can see here 
this looks like a big old jumbled mess. But as you increase going to one right here, you become completely correlated between the other variable. Zoom in a little bit so you could get kind of a better depiction. The closer it is to this white value, all these on the diagonal here are completely correlated because it's with itself. Anything else is close by, you can see like something like this right here for total rooms above ground versus ground living area are highly correlated. You can see that this first floor and total basement look like it's pretty correlated as well, right? This one right here, total rooms above ground as well as total living area, same thing. Let's get a better depiction of what this looks like with some actual values rendered. From the carrot library. I imported this in and did a threshold of 0.6. You could do it, you know, higher if you wanted, but this is just to illustrate what's going on. I left verbose equals true, so it prints off all this extra stuff, and I wanted the names for these right here. This is the important part. These are the actual values from our data set that are creating the correlations. <laughs> Sales price, ground living area, first floor square feet, total rooms above ground, etc. Here's the correlation values. It also gives you where these values come from. So this explains these correlations. I, I threw this arbitrary selection criteria of 0.6. You could have raised it or whatever, but that's letting, letting you know that those are highly correlated, which means it violates and gives us issues with our linear regression assumptions. Let's scroll down here. These purple ones are negative correlation. But we look at this right here, this triangle from full bath all the way up to, I don't know, year built. All of these right here correspond to high correlation within our data set, which is amazing. All of these right here. Now, we can see, for instance, that the ground living area and the total rooms above ground, looking at the Y and the X axis where these meet, you get a 0.81. The sales price versus ground living area, 0.71. Sales price versus the total rooms above ground, 0.5. So this is going to come into play. Let's look at what one of these looks like if we plot this out, all right? You could take this code if you want and pause the video. Now this is our sales price on the Y and the ground living area. And you can see this really bunched up. Let's evaluate this real quick and see how this looks in a linear model. When we show a linear model, we just do the LM, we throw in the sales price that we're looking at, and then what are we evaluating against? The ground living area, and we decide to add in your total rooms above ground. And notice something here, the highly negative total rooms above ground. This is interesting because this is affecting us quite a bit. Let's take this out and see how we can evaluate each of these separately and how would it affect the model. Here we go. We can see that this is slightly decreased from the above. We can also see that the value here, when it's evaluated separately, is quite a bit higher in an order of magnitude plus, which means that while we have to be selective if we're removing variables because we're always removing information to be learned, decreasing dimensions aids in the interpretation and you have to be careful. We shall do some regularization to get a handle of our data. Now what does this tell us here from evaluating this? It tells you that basically the correlation between your variables is what's screwing with the values that we saw in the first linear model. We're going to use the GLM net library to do our operations today. You're going to have this parameter called alpha. When you set it to zero, that's ridge regression. When you set it to one, it equals lasso. Any value in between is called elastic net. Elastic net is the common combination of lasso and ridge regression combined. Now behind the scenes, understand that the standardization is done by default. If you do not want GLMNet to do standardization for your data, put false. You do this in the case that you did this standardization yourself in whatever formatting you did. Also understand that ridge and lasso will be performed with multiple lambda values behind the scenes. The lambda values performed by default will be 100. You can also change this if you want. Now, ridge regression remember keeps all of your variables and it shrinks them toward zero. It never exactly gets to zero. And what you're doing for this GLM net 
you're throwing in your X train, your Y train, and our alpha equals zero because we're doing ridge regression for this example. We plot this off and we notice a few things. The first thing, this top value for 301 tells you that there's 301 variables that are used in your model. This is taking on the X axis the log of your lambda values. Your coefficient values are going to be on your Y axis. And what's going on here is that you're seeing that the higher the lambda, the closer you get toward zero. So you're removing more noise the higher your lambda. There's a point in which you have a happy medium within this model that'll be your minimum lambda value and your first standard error value, which would be basically a pocket where that's your sweet spot for your model. And we're going to show that in a, in a minute. As the lambda increases towards the max lambda, then the coefficients get really small and go towards zero. Let's look at a few things. When you run this GLM net, you can call a few parameters. We can get our lambda values. You could find the min and the max, just put parentheses around it. And that's what's going on here. For our model, here's the min and the max value for our lambda. But what is that really telling us? Nothing right now because we haven't done any cross-validation to find the best value. That's just the range of values that it falls within. We can get the coefficients corresponding to each feature. Okay, for instance, I printed off these two features, just chose to print them off, and here's their values. And the takeaway, these are approaching zero. They're extremely small numbers, 10 to the minus 40 and 30. So as we hit the max lambda, they approach these really small numbers. As we're in the very beginning, they're quite small, but not as small as they are in the end. And this is what they are at the beginning of your plot. To find that best value that we want, cross-validation, like I said. We have 301 variables to use. We're going to do a few things. We're going to have the y-axis as our mean squared error, the log of lambda for our x-axis, and we're going to have some dotted lines. This is going to correspond to your one standard error error and your minimum lambda value. That's that sweet spot I was telling you. To do the cross validation, you do the same thing with GLM, but you put CV dot in front. We're going to use this type measure since we're doing our linear regression today. You can also throw this in as well if you want. If you're doing logistic regression, you would have to change this. Okay. We're setting our seed. We're doing our cross validation now with our train X and Y with our zero. And we're going to get this printout where it still looks the same as before. But now we have our little division lines telling us basically where the best parameters are going to lie, which are in here. And this on the y-axis is our standard error. So we're at a really small number, 0.02, maybe something like that. We can find what that value is corresponding to each of these points. So in practice, when you're trying to measure how well your model compares, for instance, the root mean squared error or the mean squared error, Think of it like this. It's your predicted error, basically your standard deviation of the residuals, simply how far you, your error is from your line. That's what's going on. This is going to look a little confusing, but it's not bad. Really, I don't need this piece, but here's a cross validation that we're using. From this cross validation, we need to take the minimum value from our lambda. So I did this, these two lines, two different ways so you can see it, but it's doing the same thing. This one is taking my cross validation and you have this S parameter that takes in your minimum lambda value or you can plug in instead of lambda min, you could do one standard error, but keep it consistent with the way you're trying to do this. We do the same thing for a test so we can figure out what our error looks like. After you do these predictions, you will do the prediction minus your test y and your train y. Square those values and take the mean and then square root that and that gives you the root mean squared error for each of these. If you do not do the square root, you just have the mean squared error, which is fine. What we have here for the ridge is this for our test error. Now look at where our crossing of the root mean squared error is for our minimum values. So for the vertical lines that we saw before, I'm taking the CVM from our cross validation model that we just did. And this will give me my minimum standard error. Then to find the lambda value at that minimum MSE, you just do this. For the cross validation, you do the dollar sign lambda dot min. If you don't want this min, you could do the one standard error. Just 
just keep it consistent. Then to find the one standard error, we're going to do the same thing with the CVM, but you need to do this right here. So here's our one standard error that we're finding. And then to find the lambda value for that, we do this with our fitting of our cross validation and just call the lambda dot one SE. And this is just printing everything off so we could see it nicely. So at this minimum MSE for our cross validation, we came up with this value. The corresponding lambda value at that point is this. For the 1SE, this is our value. At this point, this is the lambda value for this 1SE. When you look at the plot, it's in the log values. Here's what it looks like when you take the log of this lambda minimum MSE and the 1SE. So you can see what's going on. Now don't get hung up on the test data looking worse than the training root mean squared errors. Now let's basically get a visual stimulus of what's going on here and plug it back, plug these vertical lines back into what we had before. Understand this, the red lines are maximizing the predictive accuracy in our case, the root mean squared error. We'll be coming up to that lasso to do our feature selection next. Yay! Above all, Ridge did make an effort to push our uninteresting or useless features towards zero and handles the correlation. Unfortunately, while we do get rid of the noise, we can do better but we need to remove variables. Removing variables removes the information, affects your accuracy, blah, blah, blah. So here's the plotting of this. Just took the GLM net for our ridge, did an ab line, did the log of our lambda values for our one SE and our lambda minimum and added them on. And this is what we end up with. So it looks kind of pretty with all the colors, but between these two dotted lines is gonna be our best fit model with all this junk that looks crazy, but that's what it is. We can look at the top 25 most interesting features for our model. And we have to think about something. Why are we using Ridge versus Lasso? Well, here's something to think about. Consider if we believe that we needed to retain all of our variables, but wanted to reduce the noise in our data. This would be a good start, but you are keeping all the variables. So if you have a crazy amount of features, this may cause some issues like computation or interpretation, etc. Here's the code. If you want to do this plot right here, now feel free to pause the video for this as well, but this is what's going on. Here's the coefficients on the X axis and on the Y axis, all of our features. And this is what it looks like for the rich. Let's do some lasso regression. We have something that's really cool and you're gonna see it in a second, I'll show you. I want you to notice something when we're doing this. We're going from 301 or 302 variables to 292 right out the gate. But that's not the whole story because remember, we have those division lines, those vertical lines that are going to be our sweet spot, which is going to get us even further down and features, okay? Gonna reduce more noise and junk. So this look, scroll down. This is pretty easy. We changed our alpha to one. We threw it in the GLM net and we did our training on our X and our Y. So scroll down. We have 292 features you see at the top. Here's our coefficients and here's our log of lambdas. And this is what it looks like for our data so far. And how are we going to do some interpreting for this? So let's look at something from negative six to negative four. That looks like a pretty good region that we're going to end up finding to be our sweet spot. But notice that by that point, most of the features are already set to zero. Anything after that is just useless and doesn't really help the model. You see that you have some really strong values here, which would correspond to some really high ordinary least squares values. Okay, we also have issues with a lot of correlation. So essentially, we're gonna get down to this range here. So here's the plot for this. If you wanna follow along, very simple. The only thing you change is you add this right here, CV dot, because we're doing cross validation. And this is cool because it's showing you, okay, we're at about 170 to 78. Okay, so this is the range of features that we're gonna end up keeping, something within this. So that's looking promising. Now the actual values that correspond to these Lambda values with their relative errors, we'll print that out. So do the same thing that we did above where we're taking our cross validated model. We're doing the CSM and this is giving us the minimum MSE. We're finding the lowest value for our Lambda. We can find our one SE here like we did in the ridge and we're doing the same thing plug and chug. Now let's see what this looks like. For the minimum MSE for our cross validation using Lasso, we end up with this value. Here's the corresponding Lambda for it. Here's the one SE, its corresponding value, and the log of the Lambda values that we have from the plot above. 
to do the cross validation will be just like the cut and paste from what we did for the ridge but now we're just changing the name to lasso and keeping it at a one for our alpha everything is the same from doing it before we run our cross validation model we have to do for our tuning now we're doing our prediction where we're calling our fit model for our lasso cross validation calling in our x train and taking the lambda dot minimum like I said before, you can do the 1SE, just be consistent. To do the prediction to get the test information, we do the same thing here, just set up a different formatting where I'm calling the regular model here, taking the test value, and then what minimum value I got from the cross-validation. These are doing the same exact thing, just shown different ways so you don't get confused. Here's the error that we get for the root mean squared for our test in our train using lasso. We did the prediction minus the the test of y and the same thing of train squared them took the mean did the square root comparing this to the ridge we notice that the ridge value is less than our lasso okay then what's going on we have influential features with lasso while we are able to forego reducing our features there's also a sacrifice in your prediction accuracy again just like ridge your collinear features will get pushed towards each other instead of showing trends such as going really positive or negative but they will go exactly to zero for your features using lasso Let's look at the top influential variables for our data. You run the coefficient parentheses, you throw in your 1SE or your, lamb or your lambda of minimum, your cross validation, and then all of this. Stop the video and pause that if you want that code. Here's what it looks like for our positive correlation and our negative correlated variables relative to their coefficients. Before we move on to something else, let's notice something. These values for the ridge and the lasso MSE are very close, but this is a little deceiving. For instance, if we're trying to minimize that MSE, we have to be very accurate in our predictions. This is of course rounded. If you're doing something such as a Kaggle exercise or competition, this is extremely important and means a lot, especially in your ranking. Here's our elastic net, just like what we've done before, but now it's combining lasso and ridge together in one, okay? The downside of lasso, it's not strictly convex. For instance, if we had two features that were identical, then we would, would not be able to distinguish them when we're trying to minimize. In this instance, you would like to use elastic net because it will give a unique solution. Elastic net allows us to establish regularization with a combination of lasso and ridge. But there are downsides. While we're able to reduce the noise and collinearity, we're still restricted to linear assumptions. Finding a specific alpha in that case can be time consuming since we have to do iterating to find the optimal solution to retrieve the lowest root mean squared value. And if you see that you have nonlinear behavior, just switch models and do something else. To find the optimal alpha parameter, you can do this that I adapted from online left it in the link in my citations now what this is doing is taking the values from zero incrementing by 0.1 and going to one where zero is our ridge one is our lasso and anything between is the elastic net when you get those results it'll print out like this meaning that for ridge this is what we got for lasso this is what we got anything in between elastic net it appears in this circumstance by the way i set up my data which may or may not be correct just depends on how you're setting it up it appears that ridge is the best predictor now we're doing the elastic net it's the same as everything we did before you just change the alpha value to whatever you're using i just did 0.5 just to illustrate this so you can see what our error looks like it's not better than the ridge so it doesn't matter which is expressed by the table above when we're Comparing elastic net to lasso and ridge, you can see that the ridge did better than any of them for these data. The takeaway ridge test data performed the best. Elastic net did no better than ridge. Finishing thoughts, depending on if you use raw file or formatted, you can have quite different results. And it depends on if these data are updated or changed at any time through R Studio. The Kaggle data set versus the R library could be different. And you may have to do a lot of cleaning of your data, depending on how you pre-process your 
your model for selection, you could have different results. Depending on how you do dummy variables, that could give you different results. Also, depending on how you disregard sporadic data and outliers, that can change your model. There's always room to improve. Here's three examples of doing the same thing, just in different ways. Please consider averaging and, and doing weights um, on your models to help you from overfitting. As always, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you subscribe, turn on that notification bell. I hope this brought utility to someone. I'll see you in the next video. Please consider buying me a coffee. See you in the next one. Bye.